So what do these pieces of trash have in common? That's a question that I've asked tens of thousands of students in my career as a humane educator. Somebody who teaches about pressing global challenges in an effort to provide students with the knowledge and the tools and the motivation to be conscientious choice makers and engaged change makers for a more just, healthy, and humane world. So after they've guessed, I tell them that objects just like these were found inside the body of a dying sperm whale beached on a North Carolina coast. And I invite them to take one of these pieces of trash back to their desk and to consider what could have been done to prevent this from happening, both from a personal standpoint, but also from a systemic societal standpoint. Which then leads me to ask this question. How can each of us make choices in our lives to do the most good and the least harm to ourselves, to other people, to animals, and to the environment? I call this the MOGO principle, MOGO being short for most good. And doing the most good and the least harm is something that virtually everybody thinks is a good idea. And it sounds like a simple principle. I mean, it doesn't sound like the kind of rocket science we often hear about in TED Talks. But it's actually quite challenging to put into practice. And there are four primary challenges. The first is that in today's world, we lack knowledge about the effects of our choices. We simply don't know where and how most of our food and products and clothes and building materials and energy were produced. Although in the internet age, we could find out. Which leads me to the second challenge. Many, if not most of us, lack the will to get this knowledge. Now why is that? Well, a number of years ago, I was on a bus trip with a friend of mine, and we pulled into a rest area, and she went out to get something to eat. And she came back with a bag of food from McDonald's, and she put it down, and she looked at me, and she said, Zoe, don't tell me about it. I don't want to know. I was not going to comment on her food choices. But what I really think she was saying is that if she learned about the animal cruelty and the environmental destruction and the health impacts of her food choices, but then made those same choices, she would be faced with the reality that she was allowing her desires to eclipse her values. And that doesn't feel very good. And by the way, while adults often say this, kids rarely do. In my 25 years as a humane educator, having taught tens of thousands of young people, only once has one of them said, I don't want to know. But let's say you do want to know, because you want to live with more integrity. Well, then you're going to be faced with the third challenge, which is that there are so many cruel and destructive systems from which we can't easily extricate ourselves. I'm guessing that you have a cell phone or a car or a computer, probably all three. And I'm also guessing that you don't want to be complicit in exploitive child labor or in people and animals being exposed to toxic chemicals or a host of other abuses to the environment, to humans, to other species. And yet, we are complicit. Between the procurement of the raw materials and the production and the eventual disposal of our electronics lies a path of oppression and destruction. Which brings me to the fourth challenge. Faced with our complicity, but without obvious alternatives, some people decide that their choices don't make a difference. So I wrote a book called Most Good, Least Harm to give people keys to meet these four challenges. And one of those keys is this. To the best of our ability, each one of us can model our message and work for change, which are two sides of the same coin. Now, what do I mean by model our message? Well, Mahatma Gandhi was once asked by a reporter, what is your message? Now, Gandhi had a big message. He was trying to free his country from British rule using only nonviolent methods. I don't think that had ever been done before. But on that particular day, his response was simply this. My life is my message. I remember being so struck by the universality of that statement. 
I realized that if Gandhi's life was his message, then my life was my message. That in fact, all of our lives are our message, whether we like it or not. The question then becomes, are we living our lives in a way that we're modeling the message we most want to model? Are we making choices that truly reflect our values? Now, most of us value kindness and compassion and wisdom, and we know what that looks like in our interpersonal relationships. But what do kindness and wisdom look like when we make other choices? What does it mean to be kind and wise if the foods we eat were produced through cruelty to animals and environmental destruction, and if the clothes we wear were made unsustainably and inhumanely, and if the products we buy were produced through the exploitation and abuse of others and then quickly wind up in landfills and incinerators. Modeling a message of kindness means, among other things, committing to learn about the effects of our choices and then spending our money wisely because every dollar we spend is a vote that says, do it again. But while it's so important that we consciously model our message by making choices that do the most good and the least harm, it's not enough. Because there is no number of compact fluorescent light bulbs and lead certified buildings and shade-grown fair trade cups of coffee that are going to save the world. Which brings me to the bad news. At this point in history, we are facing looming and unprecedented crises between global climate change and the potential loss of half of all species on Earth by the end of this century, and a growing population of over 7 billion people, each of whom needs access to clean water and adequate food and a home and economic opportunity at a time when we face dwindling resources, things look pretty great. Right now, you might be wondering if there's a more uplifting TED Talk that you could be listening to. So let me just say that despite these looming crises, I have never felt more hopeful. And here's the good news. Never before in recorded history have we lived in less violent, less discriminatory, and less cruel times. Groups that had been disenfranchised for centuries are gaining rights and protections. And while there are still atrocities and injustices, and while we face grave problems, never before have we been able to collaborate and innovate across every border to solve them. All this is to say that time is of the essence. We can transform destructive and unsustainable systems and avert potential catastrophes, and we're poised to do so. And each of us can participate by bringing our talents and our will to bear on the issues that most concern us, making sure that through our work and our volunteerism and our acts of citizenship and our charitable giving, we are transforming inhumane and myopic systems into ones that are sustainable and just. So, what system do you most want to change? What skills and talents could you bring to bear and what do you love to do? When each of us finds the point where the answer to those three questions meet, we just might find our life's great purpose. And many people are finding this perfect intersection. And I want to tell you about a few of them. Mohammed Yunus was an economics professor in Bangladesh during his country's great famine. And he began to wonder, what was all his economics expertise good for? if he couldn't even help the people in his own community. So using his knowledge, he transformed a system, banking, by loaning small amounts of money to poor women who had no collateral, launching a microcredit movement that has spread around the globe, lifting millions of people out of poverty. And then there's Henry Spira, who was a teacher and an organizer. He was horrified when he learned about product testing on animals in which substances like oven cleaner and cosmetics and bleach were squeezed into the eyes of conscious rabbits and smeared onto the abraded skin of animals and then force-fed to them in quantities that kill. 
So using his skills as a teacher and an organizer, he raised money to take out a full page ad in the New York Times that read, how many rabbits does Revlon blind for beauty's sake? With a picture of a rabbit whose eyes had been blacked out. That ad instigated a massive movement against product testing on animals, spurring Revlon and other companies to develop non-animal testing methods. And while many companies still test their products on animals, each of us has the opportunity and the choice to buy personal care and cleaning products that aren't tested on animals. One more story. Katie Redford was a law student when she traveled to Burma and witnessed the human rights abuses that were being perpetrated by a military junta to secure an oil pipeline for the California company Unical. She got back to law school and she wrote a paper invoking this obscure 18th century law to argue that US companies should be able to be sued for their human rights violations abroad. Well, she got an A on her paper and that could have been the end of it. Because while her professor lauded her work, he also said it would never happen. But she spent the next decade bringing her case to court, and she won, setting a precedent and changing an unjust system. So the system that I've been working to change is the system of education. Because just as we can't create a humane and sustainable world solely by modeling our message, we also can't do it without the commitment and the involvement of the next generation. The real potential of the MOGO principle to do the most good and the least harm lies in education. Thoreau once said, there are thousands hacking at the branches of evil to one that is striking at the root. Gandhi said as much too, although in a less violent way, when he proclaimed, if we are to reach real peace in the world, we shall have to begin with children. The education of children is the root system that underlies all other systems and the root solution I believe we must address. The most profound, thank you. The most profound and significant way to create positive change is to ensure that our students have the knowledge and the skills and the conviction to do the most good and the least harm. After all, the world becomes what we teach. Unfortunately, in today's world, at least in the US, the prevailing purpose of schooling, what you hear about from policymakers and politicians, has little to do with preparing students to create peaceful and sustainable systems in the world and everything to do with preparing them to, quote, compete in the global economy. As if this limited goal is worthy of our children's great minds and big hearts and good enough given the problems that we face. Of course our children need to be verbally and mathematically and scientifically literate and able to find jobs, but the purpose of their education has to go far beyond this. Given the crises that we are facing, our students need to understand the effects of their choices, and they need to have the skill and the will to address destructive and unsustainable systems. They need to be prepared to be what I call solutionaries, who are eager and able to develop humane products, feed their communities sustainably, create renewable energy sources, engineer eco-friendly buildings and transportation systems and support societies that are good and healthy for all. Students are so hungry for this kind of education. In my career, I've had people tell me that a course they took with me when they were 13 changed their life. I've watched a middle school class that was totally apathetic and didn't give a hoot about poverty on Monday become passionately engaged in making a difference by Friday. And I've received countless thank you letters from students whose schools I have visited. One eighth grade girl wrote this. Spending that week with you was the most inspiring five days of my life so far. 
you made me realize just how much one person can do to help the world and how much more you can do by educating others. She then went on to say that she'd already started teaching her parents. <laughs> I loved that. And of course, you know, it feels great to know that a course I taught changed somebody's life. And when I first read that letter, I felt awesome until I started thinking about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, there is something seriously wrong here because spending a week with me should not be the most inspiring five days of any teenager's life. Her whole education should be inspiring. All of her teachers should be humane educators who bring relevant information and meaning for today's world into their curricula, no matter what subjects they teach, so that no child ever forgets for a moment that they have the capacity and the responsibility to contribute to a better world. A couple of years ago, I was teaching a course to educators at the Institute for Humane Education, and there was a wonderful English teacher there who loved superheroes. So for his presentation to the group, he designed an activity in which he invited students to think about what superhero they would want to be and what superpower they would want to have. And he prefaced his presentation by giving an example. He said that he imagined me as Mogo Girl, which was a little embarrassing. But it got me thinking, what superpower would Mogo Girl have? So here's the power that I wish I had. Mogo Girl would instantaneously enable people to access their compassion and wisdom, to immediately see the effects of their choices, and to harness their talents and their will to make this world a better place. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. But I am so not a superhero. But I love being a humane educator, and I've dedicated my life to enabling other people to be humane educators too. Because I believe that the greatest hope for our future lies in a knowledgeable and caring populace whose critical and creative thinking capacities and collaborative skills have been cultivated and honed so that everyone is ready and able to do the important work that lies ahead. So, I hope that you will harness your talents and will in service to your passions and vision for a better world. And I hope that to the best of your ability, you will model your message by doing the most good and the least harm. And because what we teach our children is so fundamental to the world that we hope to create, I hope you will join me in working to transform the limited view of education that we currently hold and embrace the limitless power education has to bring about a better world. Because whether or not you are a concerned citizen or you are a parent or a teacher or a student, our children will be creating the future. And I hope that one day we will look back at this time in history and say this was the solutionary generation when we worked together to solve our challenges and create a healthy and humane and just world for everyone. Thank you so much.